Hello, VC. It's Danny. Um, I know it's been a while. I've uh, been kind of busy. I haven't had time to shoot a video. But um, I got some records in recently that I wanted to show and uh, some stuff I've been listening to. So let's see how we go. All right. In my um, thanks to the VC video, I mentioned that I was waiting on a record to show up. Um, and it did show up. Uh, this is Death Blues Ensemble. Um, this was recommended by Teddy at Eat Sleep Vinyl um, in one of his excellent Vinyl Orgy videos. And I'd kind of been intrigued by it since I saw the video. I finally saw a copy on Discogs. And um, a little side note, this was listed for much more than I was willing to pay on Discogs. But I went and I checked the um, the sales history. And the sales history average was much closer to a price that I wanted, even though it was far below the Discogs asking price. Um, but the listing had a make offer deal on there. So I made an offer that was more than $20 less than what the record was, what they were asking. And I, I got it. So, um... I've had some bad luck with the uh, make an offer feature, particularly on Discogs. Um, eBay's been much better for me, um, but it was just I was kind of happy to 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 take a big leap and, and have it pay off. Um, back to the record, I, I listened to this in full last night. Um, this is really incredible, um, epic music. It's it's. It's haunting. It's it's really it's a meditation on death. Um, music that I think was put together over a long period of time, um, so, but it feel feels very 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 cohesive. Um, it really kind of feels like a large piece with multiple movements. Um, this is a record that I think I'll, I'll definitely need to be revisiting multiple times before I've unearthed everything that it has to offer um it's it's an intense listen it's not a casual listen by any means um but highly recommended um i would check out teddy's um uh, teddy's channel over at eat sleep vinyl to get a, a better rundown than i can give but um yeah death blues ensemble it's a great pickup so Kind of sticking with the blues. I've been in a blues kind of place lately. And um, I was out at Amoeba a little while ago. And I heard them play um, I'm Gonna Cross That River of Jordan by Jaybird Coleman. Um, which was a song that I was familiar with. Um, actually... Through this book. Um, this is R. Crumb's Heroes of Blues, Jazz, and Country. It's a collection of um, the the trading card art that... Let's see if you can get a good... There's the Memphis Jug Band there. Um, Crumb uh, used to do trading cards that were... They came in sets of 36, I believe. Um, I, according to the intro to this book, it's a really excellent intro written by Terry Zweigoff, uh, who directed the Chrome documentary, which is mandatory viewing as far as I'm concerned. Um, so Nick Pearls, who ran Yazoo Records, uh, wanted kind of some added incentive to get people purchasing stuff, some other stuff to sell other than just records. And Crum had the idea that he would um, make trading cards of, of his favorite um, musicians, uh, pre-war musicians. And it's a gorgeous book, um, full of wonderful information. I got This is not my first copy. This is a copy I snagged for like $12 off of Amazon, um, which I highly recommend you do. But um, it comes with... It's in the CD player. But it comes with a CD, which is normally there. 
There you can maybe see the track listing. And years ago, when I first picked this book up, this was my introduction to pre-war blues, um, country, jazz. Um, I had really very, very little exposure to no exposure to it um, before that. Um, and it's, it's the best crash course that I can imagine. Um, it's a fantastic mix. Just the blues section, Memphis Jug Band on the road again, Blind Willie McTell, Dark Knight Blues, Cannon's Jug Stompers, Minglewood Blues, Skip James, Hard Time Killing Floor Blues, Jaybird Coleman, I'm Gonna Cross the River of Jordan some of these days, which is the song that I was mentioning earlier, Charlie Patton, High Water Everywhere, which is a mind-blowing song if you haven't heard that song, and Frank Stokes, I Got Mine. Um, here's Frank Stokes on the cover. So when I was out shopping and I heard the Jaybird Coleman song, I I thought I wonder I bet you that's on a Yazoo comp. I need to go track down some Yazoo records, and I found a very reasonably priced, um, a nice black label Yazoo copy. Um, and it kind of reignited, uh, in a way, my obsession with Yazoo records. I've been collecting them for years. They're they're not they're not easy to find, um, but they're not they're not gone yet. Um, this one in particular, Ten Years of Black Country Religion, um, focuses on gospel and religious music. Um, there's some really interesting cuts from Charlie Patton, "Lord I'm Discouraged," "Prayer of Death," Part One and Two. Um, you kind of get to hear him in a, in a different light than you might be used to. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll just keep going here. I, I pulled a few Yazoo. Um, so when I was younger and I had just started reading that book and listening to that CD, my brother was going to a record fair once back on the East Coast, and I said, look out for some Yazoo records. And he managed to track down this record. Um which is Bottleneck Blues, Guitar Heroes, Guitar Classics, excuse me. Um, and I remember uh, hearing Robert Johnson's Milk Cow's Calf Blues Take Two on here. And that was beyond that CD. That was one of the first, uh, the first pre-war blues songs that really, really stuck with me. Um, and this is one of the first Yazoo comps that I ever picked up. This is not actually my first copy. Um... For whatever reason, I've seen this more than I've seen any other Yazoo blues. My theory is that it's um, it's it's ten twenty six in the series, which means it's the twenty sixth uh, record, and I, I'm just assuming that was enough time for Yazoo to to have built up a cult following and and to have found its way to a larger audience. Uh, Yazoo records, from what I understand, never never sold in large quantities. Um, I would also assume that the inclusion of a Robert Johnson track would have made this uh, a more appealing pick if you were diving in the deep end. Um, if you ever see this comp, pick it up immediately. It's fantastic all the way through. Um, what is tough for me about these comps is that I know the songs better than I know the names that go along with them sometimes. I, I feel like I'm always doing my homework here. But um, anyway, not to belabor it. Highly, highly recommended. Um, just quickly, here's just another one. Frank Stokes' Dream. Um, I really love Frank Stokes. He's... Uh, He's just got a rich voice. Uh, he's a great guitar player. He's got great rhythm. Um, it's very accessible pre-war blues um, without sacrificing it. You know, it's not light. It's not, you're not missing out on anything that makes pre-war blues uh, really great by listening to Frank Stokes. You're, you're really getting the best of the bunch. Um, there's some Cannon's Drug Stoppers on here, Memphis Mini, Furry Lewis. Um, just... Really, really great 
great music. Um, this is one of the earlier comps. Um, so, like I say, if I see a Yazoo record, I just I just pick it up. I don't hesitate. Um, I count myself lucky each time I find one. Um, so, this is all leading somewhere. I don't, um, I had a really great find. Uh, so, this is the first Yazoo Records comp, Mississippi Blues, um, 27 to 41. And it's got Charlie Patton, Skip James, uh, Geechee Wiley, who's incredible, uh, Sun House, Robert Johnson, Charlie Patton. I already said him, but he's on both sides of the record. Um, this one I've had for a little while. I've had a couple copies. Um, only a couple, just two. Uh, but this one I was very excited to find. I picked it up because it's a black label. And with Yazoo, black label means it's an early 60s pressing. Red label means it's a late 60s pressing. And the rainbow label, multicolored, means you're into the 70s. And all, all of them are worth picking up. Nick Pearls was the guy who ran this label, and he was regarded as one of the uh, the 78 collectors of, of his time, the 60s and 70s, I guess. Um, and all the cuts on, on these albums come... He, it, it's basically him releasing his collection as compilations. And he's... There are stories of him uh, shaking the record player as, as he's recording it to avoid um, an imperfection in the grooves. He was supposedly some, something of a wizard of uh, pulling these 78s out. And I can't believe I haven't said this yet. The reason that I am obsessed with the Azu Blues, the reason I collect them so fiercely, is because... Nick Pearls did such a great job of transferring these 78s to these comps that when I listen to a Yazoo record, that the gulf of time, you know, the almost 100 years between now and 1927 really disappears, and I feel like I, can, I am, I may as well be, or I'm as close as I can get to being in the room with, with the performer it really it humanizes the music um and maybe it's all in my imagination but there's something you know you stream one of these songs from youtube and you hear excuse me crackle you hear poor poor recording quality you hear old timey uh, there's a veil between this music and our time and for me when i listen to these yazoo comps that that gulf of time disappears um now the reason that this record back to that is special to me was that i noticed i don't know if i'll be able to get it to focus here but oh sorry see how it says belzona here these liner notes are referring it, belzona was the original name of yazoo records and their first five records were released under the label Belzona. And I can't remember if Belzona was the name of an old record label already, and there was some legal issue. Regardless, they had to change the name from Belzona to Yazoo. And so that made this record um, the rarest and most valuable Yazoo record that I had had. Um, it was as early as I'd ever found. I'd never, I'd never dreamed I'd find a Belzona record. And then I was out at my local, and sitting in the front of the bin was Ten Years in Memphis, a beautiful, I mean, as close to mint as you're like to get. Beautiful copy. I was gonna grab it just. It was one of those things where there was a guy standing in the blues section, and I had to figure out how rude I was going to be in terms of, like, 
getting over to that aisle and just grabbing that record out from under his nose. Luckily, he moved without even considering it. Um, this is the second Yazoo comp. And it's on Bill's owner records. And the dude that was pricing that day at my local must have just assumed he was looking at a Yazoo comp. And he priced it as a Yazoo comp. Um, I got a very, 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 very fair price on this record. And it's worth more than I would have been willing to pay for it. Uh, this is now easily the jewel of my Yazoo collection. Um, to boot, it's a fantastic comp. There's some Frank Stokes on here. Um, Furry Lewis, Tom Dixon, Robert Wilkins... Uh, Gus Cannon, it's, it's just great. Um, one of the other highlights for me of Yazoo Records is how extensive and complete the liner notes are. Um, not only does it give you something to do while you're listening to the music, uh, sometimes they'll even break down exactly which tuning the song is in. There will be there will be a breakdown. I, I, the liner notes on that 10 Years of Black Country Religion, I think, had an explanation of how Charlie Patton would, was using his thumb to, to pluck the, the bass line using the, the fifth and third string rather than the sixth and fourth. Just a level of detail that you don't, a level of care that you don't find anymore. Um, and it really makes, the, makes those comps really something special for me um so nick pearls who ran yazoo also ran a companion label called blue goose um and they look very similar um there's a very cohesive kind of uh design to the to the layout of everything but blue goose was um, the label on which Pearls recorded and released uh, modern artists who, to his mind, were up to snuff, which would have been a pretty short list, and everything I've heard so far on Blue Goose is, has absolutely been a treat. This is Larry Johnson. This is the first Blue Goose release. Um, it's got an incredible version of Keep It Clean, opens it up. Uh, just really, really uh, studied and capable finger picking guitar here ragtime uh, full of rhythm really syncopated um yeah if you ever see this i highly recommend it um this would be another good place to start with blue blue goose these blues is meant to be barrel housed this is the third blue goose release uh, it's a comp of multiple blue goose artists so Larry Johnson is on here, John Lewis, Bill Williams, um, Graham Hine. Uh, there's some really good stuff on here. So Blue Goose, just like Yazoo, if you see it, snag it. And so all of that led me to this find. This was a, an online find. I just got a deal on eBay. I was, there's, you can see, I'm sure there's some water damage here on the cover, but it's, it's staining. It's not, um, it doesn't really affect the integrity of the, of the sleeve. And so the price on this was much more affordable. This is, you know, like a $40 record most of the time. Um, but this is Joanne Kelly with John Fahey, and it's another early Blue Goose release. Uh, this is fantastic. Joanne Kelly was a British um, blues artist, and one of the very few um, British blues artists who is considered to have had a significant contribution to the blues, to have something really to say about it. Um, it's... I, I don't know, I mean, 
her version of Hard Time Killing Floor Blues on here is worth the whole album, even even as an expensive album. It's great. Um, if you are a fan of Karen Dalton and you don't you you're sad that there's only those two records and a couple comps and you wish there was more, seek out Joanne Kelly. Um, she has some more records which I don't have, which I'll be seeking out myself. Um, but just great stuff. Um, I thought this was pretty cool. The um, well, there's an odd anomaly here, which this is the original gold label for Blue Goose. This is the later blue and orange label. This copy just must have been pressed when they were changing over from one to the next. Um, but the other neat thing is how intact the original Blue Goose liner or inner sleeve is. Um, R. Crumb's band, R. Crumb and the Cheap Suit Serenaders, was released on Blue Goose, which would probably be the most well-known Blue Goose releases. But, I mean, just for me, everything about the design, the content, the quality of these records is... I mean, if you want to talk about fetish, fetishizing records, this is these are the records that I fetishize. Um, speaking of that, I wanted to highlight another book really quickly. Um, Do not sell at any price. Uh, it's a, an oral history of obsessive seventy-eight record collectors. It's fantastic. Uh, Amanda Petrushit Petrusic. I believe, is a great writer. Um, you'll see her writing pop up. She's been working a lot lately in uh, just music writing. If you see her name, read the article. It's worth reading, I guarantee. Um, this book is the best description of record collecting that I've ever read. Um, outside of High Fidelity, which is very fictionalized, and, and uh, you know, um, this is... This is it. This is it's great. It's fantastic. I I've had trouble reading in the last few years. I just never seemed to finish a book. I couldn't stop reading this book. Um, the little gems. Somebody saying this is a line I underlined. That's one of the reasons why I collect in the sphere that I collect in. Because I don't have anybody telling me what's good and what's not. I mean, that's that I think is one of the appeals for me behind record collecting is, it, it, I don't care how many Spotify listens it has. I don't care if this band is blowing up right now or not. I want to go explore what I'm interested in, and I want to explore the physical media and uh, and own it and discover it myself. Um, I mean, it's it just it just goes so deep. She she cared so so much about getting this story right. Um, this is a little a little long, but but stick with me. Um, as white urbanites discovered the race records of the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties, they reshaped the music to fit their own tastes and desires, creating a rich mythology that often bears little resemblance to the reality of the musicians they admire. It's a grand illusion that perpetuated, perhaps, that was per perpetuated, perhaps, by the Blues Mafia, referring to the dudes who collected 78s, um, but probably had much earlier origins. There was a good chance it was a part of the blues legend from the beginning, a colorful way of marketing a new style. That's just such a, a true and specific observation about how blues has been um, embraced in our culture. It, and it, it has, in large part, been sold to, to dudes like me, white guys, who kind of, um, you know, we, we mythologize these, these recordings as being real and raw, and they came from, you know, there, there's a bit of a condescension that happens. And like, oh, this guy in a shack, and he had nothing, just a shack. And then, you know, 
Alan Lomax came and discovered him, and then look at that, and that's Muddy Waters. I mean, some of that may be true, but we've lionized that part of the myth to an extent that I'm I'm curious about, at the very least. I don't know that it's healthy. It, it, it intrigues me. Um, what's the real story? Um, this is a great book if you're at all interested in any of the stuff that I'm talking about. And on that note, if you are interested in pre-war blues um, and you're kind of not into tracking down a bunch of rare old records from the 60s and 70s that didn't sell very well, I would highly recommend Mississippi Records. This is um, Last Kind Words, a Geechee Wiley song, which if you have not heard it, just go listen to it now. G-E-E-C-H-I-E-W-I-L-E-Y, Geechee Wiley. Last Kind Words, it's haunting. It's incredible. Um, and it's another one that I was turned on to by R. Crumb. I've really, I'm a fan of his artwork, um, and I find him to be an intriguing person. And so he, I, he has led me down the rabbit hole of pre-war blues and country and jazz. Um, Mississippi Records is absolutely carrying the torch for Yazoo. If, in terms of modern record companies, this is the best you're going to get in terms of how old 78s transferred to to modern vinyl. Um, beautiful pressings, very anti-corporate, very kind of punk. If you wanted to subscribe to Mississippi Records, you need to send them cash or a check. They don't do PayPal, they don't do any of that. It can be a little difficult. Little Axe Records is a sister company of theirs, and you can order these comps for like $10 from Little Axe, and if you see them in a record store, you're gonna pay eighteen twenty. dollars um, Check out Mississippi Records. Um, I pulled a few here just to just to show a little range. Um, this is the Georgia Sea Island Singers. And this music is available in other formats. You can get a CD of this stuff. These are Alan Lomax recordings. There's a lot of that on Mississippi Records. Um, I should have pulled it. There's a fantastic box set called Root Hog or Die, put together by a guy named Nathan Salzberg, who now runs the Alan Lomax archive. Um, but anyway, the Georgia Sea Island Singers, this is vocal music, beautiful, incredible, multi-layered harmonies. Some of them don't even technically work, but it, but then it works. Um, yeah, uh, just incredible stuff. Um, great sound, great packaging. Mississippi Records, the only complaint. I could have is that they're not big on liner notes. It's ve they very much present a package and some music on it. Um, done beautifully, but a little short on the uh, the literature. This is Washington Phillips. What are they doing in heaven today? Um, Washington Phillips, from what I understand, was a a preacher who built his own tiny piano or modified a toy piano i don't know it's incredible incredible gospel music particularly the title track what are they doing in heaven today um there's a cover by sister rosetta Ros excuse me sister rosetta tharp which is totally worth checking out because it's sister rosetta tharp but this trumps it um as far as i'm concerned just such an incredible song and for me songs like what are they doing in heaven today hit me so hard they might as well be modern there's no difference between how this song hits me and a modern song um all right i'm going long here so i'm going to cut it there just wanted to say uh thank you again to andrew over at tales from the crates he noticed i changed my name my icon um just kind of wanted to put a little bit of anonymity between me and my channel um but thank you so much for the love. Thank you, everybody, for liking, for subscribing. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And uh, I'll be back as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.